1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. And then we're going to read to the second chapter, verse 1. Verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice or do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from A-L-L, all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. I want everybody to say this with me. He is faithful and just. Let me read that again. If we confess our sins, he is, say it with me, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from ALL, all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar because he said all have sinned. And his word is not in us. Can't be because you're not saying the same thing he said. You'd have to confess what he says 
We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We sure don't want to try to do that, do we? And his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, and that's really if you look it up, it, it simply is telling you the possibility is there. Yes. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hmm. That's beautiful. Now, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, is it warm in here this morning? Feels okay? All right. Let's bow our heads. Father, we do thank you this morning for, again, the privilege, the great honor that you have given us to be assembled together of believers of like precious faith. We thank you for the honor that we have to come into your presence this morning, to sing songs of Zion, to, Lord, to worship you together, praise you together, and now, Lord, to feed upon your word together. We pray now as we have read from the Holy Scriptures, we ask that you, the great author that used men to pen it, now will use man to preach it and men to believe it. May you take this service, Lord, may you speak to every heart, and Father, again, may you meet every need represented among us and even those that may, cannot be here or them that may be listening in. Father, you know the needs of your children. We pray you grant each one their desire in your presence in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church says, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If I was going to title this morning what we're going to talk about and possibly what we'll carry on tonight, the Lord willing, I would like to call or title our subject, The Greatest Defense Attorney. Amen. Praise the, Lord. the Greatest Defense Attorney. Now, in the scriptures, our Lord Jesus is presented to us in different ways, different types, different shadows, and knowing that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, so that every type and every shadow is fulfilled in one man called Jesus Christ. Until Brother Brandon would tell us that the Bible itself is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is called by Paul in one particular place, our apostle and high priest, Amen. which the word apostle, Brother Branham says, is one sent. Right. So when Jesus left this earth, he went into the presence of God and he was sent there on our behalf. Amen. Then, once he's there, he becomes the high priest of every believer that is in this kingdom. He's not only your apostle that's been sent into the presence of God for you, but he is there this morning as your high priest. Amen. And he intercedes as a high priest upon the confession or the profession of every child of God. But here in our text this morning, John calls Jesus Christ the righteous. He calls him our advocate. Amen. The word advocate is only mentioned one time in the whole Bible. But the Greek word is the same word that Jesus used in the Gospels when he said, when I go away, 
I will not leave you comfortless. The word comfortless, there is the same word which means an advocate. And really, every believer this morning that is baptized into the kingdom of God has the spirit in you of the one who is your advocate. And the word advocate is the Greek word, which means one who comes alongside to help. But here in John 2, 1, it is referred to someone who's not only come alongside to help, but someone who is a defender. So Christ, this morning, and I'm just going to lay this out, in the presence of God was our apostle who was sent. He got there and became the high priest to intercede upon our profession, and he is there now as our defense attorney. He is there to defend us, so he is our divine defense attorney. And he's the greatest attorney that any man could ever have. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he has never lost a case. And that's going to make you happy in a few minutes. I have no doubt that if we were to know people's occupations, once we get to glory, we will meet lawyers and attorneys there. And there's probably some today that are still practicing attorneys that will end up making it there. But in heaven, there's only one practicing attorney in heaven. All other ones are not practicing right now. So if you want someone to defend you at the bar of God, there's only one that can be hired. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else can represent you in that presence and you come out as a winner except the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our eternal practicing attorney and he is our defender of every person that has been put into this kingdom by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the language that is behind this word advocate. Now, I'm gonna say some things here this morning that's gonna make you think and then we'll... Connect it all tonight, but you've got to listen carefully. The language that is used here is legal. The word advocate is legal language. And what it presumes is this, that there is a courtroom setting in which sinners have to be accused or are accused before a holy and divine judge. That's right, man. Amen. When man fell, there was a judgment that was put upon the human race. Now, say it this way: the human race has been indicted. Right. Amen. That's exactly right. And that indictment was manifested at Mount Sinai, Amen. Amen. in which God would display His laws in ten that would literally make the whole world guilty before Almighty God. And every man, based on the law of the judge, is guilty in his presence. This is then now the hall of God's justice. The accused sinner, listen to me, comes before the bar of God and Jesus Christ comes alongside as the sinner's defense attorney. Any man that goes to court without a defense attorney is not wise. And no man wants to come into the courtroom of God where he has been indicted and represent himself. The outcome won't fare good for you. So, we are introduced here to the issue of the courtroom, the judge, 
the attorney, the one who's been indicted, and later we'll see the prosecutor. But here, there's something very basic, yet so profound when it comes to a declaration that's been given by God, you never did it. There's an understanding there that lays in God's word that maybe a man would hire an attorney to try to convince the judge that he is innocent. But in this case, every man that's going to come out innocent will have to first admit he's guilty. Any man that walks into God's presence and says, I'll represent myself and plead my own case, you are eternally doomed. I don't care what you say, what you point to, what act you point to, there is nothing that will justify you in the mind of that judge if you represent yourself. Now, salvation. Now watch. This is where I'm going to come to. Salvation is a matter of divine justice. Salvation in some ways is an operation of law before the holy judge of all. God himself. Now let's go back just for a second and let's go to the beginning where Brother Branham says God made man He placed before man two trees. And in that garden, he laid down what we would call the Adamic covenant. That covenant was an expression of the judge's law that says the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want to deal with this justice versus this mercy because it would seem like in order for us to receive salvation, God would overstep his justice in order to give us mercy. No. No. He doesn't. When we think of salvation, we have to think of salvation in the terms of not human works but divine grace. If you come to God on the grounds of any human work, I'm telling you, listen to me. If you come to God on the grounds of any human work, you will stand in that courtroom without a defender. Any man comes and tells me one thing he did to make himself righteous in that holy courtroom, you will stand there without any advocate to represent you. You will represent yourself. And when the judge lays down the hammer, you're not gonna like what you hear. Because even though he cries guilty, there's still no hope for you if justice has not been dealt with. So we think of salvation, the terms, and correctly so, divine grace and divine mercy. And when the gospel presented, we intentionally so emphasize divine grace, the mercy of God, the love of God, God's compassion. But many times, Brother David, we exclude the element that needs to be understood so that you can really enjoy all the ramifications of salvation, and that is the element of divine justice. Here's what I'm saying. Salvation is more than love, grace, kindness, loving kindness, and mercy. There's still the matter of justice. Since, listen, since God cannot disregard his own perfect holy law and justice, it has to be dealt with. Some wrongly have thought that God's love somehow overpowers his justice. Both love, watch, and justice 
are equally satisfied in God's redemptive plan. Amen. Stay with me. This will take me two messages, but I'm going to bring you to a certain point. Both God's love and his justice is equally satisfied in God's revelation of his redemptive plan. Now let's consider the imagery that's before us this morning just for a moment. Where are we at? Well, here's where we are. We're at the court of divine justice. Who is on the bench as the judge? God himself. I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to get ahead of myself. This is too good. But as that judge on the bench, he can never get around his own laws. God is obligated to his own. Listen to me, folks. If God would bypass his own law in the beginning in order to save you, then we cannot stand here with 100 complete confidence that God wouldn't bypass his own law in order to lose us or in order to heal us or anything else. There is no time in this word that God ever bypasses his own law. You got to understand this, but I will tell you God will fulfill his own law. And he is going to do for you and I what we cannot do for ourselves. And let me say this, as the holy judge, he cannot reconcile himself or you to him as a judge because he cannot get around his own law. The only thing that he could possibly do knowing that you could never get to him and become innocent as him sitting in the bench of judgment. So you could never get to him. He could step out of a judge, change his robes, and come down and become one of us. And if he ever does that, he won't bypass his law and his justice. He will fulfill his own justice. What's a mouthful right there? So, sitting on this bench is God Himself. I'll just put it in terms of Brother Ben just for a minute. He does say all this, but I just I got to go quickly. He sits there with the abstract title deed, the book of redemption, and in that book is every name that was ever going to be redeemed. I mean, now, watch Brother Ben's statement. But he could not redeem that book as spirit. So what is the responsibility of the judge? Well, to uphold the perfection of his holy law. I I do not want God to not stay true to his own law in order to save me. I do not want God to not stay true to his own word in order to redeem me. I want him to keep his word. He is just, he is just, and therefore he will render justice. God was not wrong. Brother Ben said he wasn't. When Adam did in disobedience, him and the first woman did what they did, God was just in putting them out of the garden. He was just in allowing, after so many years, death to fall upon Adam and take him to the grave. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. You know what all that was? That was the penalty of God's law, the breaking of God's law. Am I right? So, in this courtroom, we have to wrap the whole human race up in one man's decision, Adam so that every man that comes into the world will come into the world as an indicted sinner in the courtroom of God. When you come in this world, you come in with the indictment already on you. Every man comes out 
a condemned sinner. Jesus Christ, who is our defense attorney, is the one that pleads our case and on our behalf before the bar of a holy God. Now, a little bit, it's going to sound like I'm separating them, but when we put it all together, you'll realize it's all God. How many read the quote? The judge becomes... It's the self-same person. It's incredible. God, who gave the law, will die as a man under his own law. Now, think closely this morning. When we think of salvation, we think, and rightfully so, the wonderful expressions. I preach a lot. Grace, love, mercy, compassion, loving kindness, and it's all true, and we always want to present salvation in that way. But salvation is not just an act of grace or an act of love or an act of mercy. It is also an act of justice. Watch. So that God's love did not overpower his law. So that his mercy does not overwhelm his wrath. So that his compassion did not conquer his justice. He didn't lay aside his law, his justice in order to save you. But rather, God's law, let me put it this way, God's wrath and God's mercy work together. Watch, God's compassion and justice works together. God's mercy or his love and his law work together. This is the reason Brother Ben will say this to you. Grace existed before law. Grace existed during law. And grace exists after law. See, salvation is not only by grace, but by justice accomplished. Otherwise, if if justice didn't have to be dealt with, then no one should have had to die for our sins. God should have just gave us mercy. He should have just gave us grace and forgot his own law. But he didn't forget his own law. Justice had to be dealt with. Now, Salvation then is justice accomplished. God's justice was not at all ignored. Justice was not compromised. Justice was not set aside in our salvation. No, 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 no. Justice was met. Justice, here's a good word, was satisfied in salvation And it's the perfect act of divine justice and grace. Divine justice and grace is the means. It's the perfect act by which God did redeem us. Now, I'm going to lay some things out. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 3. Let's start with verse 23. Everybody with me? Say amen. amen. I'm not talking too fast, right? All right. Romans 3, 23. Here's the indictment. All, say it with me, A-L-L, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now listen to me. If any man say he hasn't sinned, he makes who a liar? God. Why? Because God said all have sinned. But then he goes on to tell us that we should sin not. Now look, folks, whether you understand or not, that's not initial salvation. That's after you're saved. Then he says, and but if, that word if is, there's a possibility you will. And the truth is you will. But if you do, you have an advocate. You have a divine defense attorney. Who is he? The righteous one, Jesus Christ. Did you notice in that verse, you're not in it. The only place you're in it is if you sin. The only one called righteous in that verse is Jesus Christ. He's the one we better be depending on. 
Now, verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the what? Now, we can't leave that word out of there. We're not just justified freely, declared righteous freely by his grace without a payment. Redemption, listen, salvation focuses on what God um, did for you. Redemption focuses on the means that he accomplished it. So when you think of redemption, you have to think of, wait a second, a price was paid. So if a price, why did I have a price have to be paid? Because justice had to be met. This is what I'm getting to you. Justice was not bypassed in order to save you. Justice was satisfied. The payment was made. He paid a debt I couldn't pay. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't know. Somebody paid the debt in order to justify us freely by grace. So in salvation, both God's law and God's justice was met. Stay with me. The redemption uh, through, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Christ, anointed one, became a man. Whom God has set forth to be the propitiation. We're going to get that word a little later tonight. The propitiation through faith that is in his blood. Brother, sister, you're going to see that the same way God openly, manifestably declared Romans 3.23 before the whole world was Mount Sinai. You're going to see that the propitiation, God through the propitiation, openly declared, manifestly declared to the whole world, not at Mount Sinai, but at Mount Calvary. And if God would help me, I could prove to you that he openly, manifestly declared before the whole world that it was accomplished at Mount Sunset. Because Amen. Amen. Right. Right. he died for that ministry. Amen. And he returned back in this day and made a declaration this day that's never been made. The only declaration that's ever been made by reformers is that we were forgiven. This message did not just declare you were forgiven. This message declared you never did it in the first place. Amen. Now, God had made him set him forth to be propitiation by through faith in his blood. For there to be blood, something has to die. To declare, now watch, to declare his righteousness, that's his justice, for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, now watch this, that he might be what? It might say just. God wasn't unjust. This sacrifice was to do what? To, 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 that he might be just. Now, he's just in that he kept his own word and in that he is now the just, the what? The fire of him that believeth in Jesus. So what God did at Calvary when it come to his justice of fulfilling his own law, he proved he was just. Then he turned around when man believes that God took full responsibility for us in Christ as our advocate at Calvary. Now he turned around and said, if you believe, I who am just will be the justifier of every man that believes in Christ. Amen. How many understand, say amen. amen. So salvation operates in the realm of justice. Justice must, watch, be met, not overstepped. Amen. Romans chapter one, verse 16. For I am not ashamed, says Paul, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, that's the Gentiles. For therein is the righteousness of God, that's justice revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just 
shall live by faith. Now, if you were to go back and pick up what Paul is quoting, it doesn't really say that they're justified by faith, but it identifies whose faith it is. And it says they are, they are justified, the just shall live by his faith. Then if you pick up Galatians 2.20, you don't have to turn there, it actually says it. Paul doesn't want to frustrate the grace of God, but he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, it isn't just the revelation of the mercy of God and the love of God and the grace of God. It is the revelation of the justice of God. Now, this is why, if you go back to 1 John 1, 9 quickly, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Listen to me. If God bypassed his own justice, he wouldn't be just. If God oversteps his own word, he wouldn't be just. I was riding down the road with Sister Lisa, and I said to her, many people grab the woman at the well, and what they don't realize is Jesus knew the woman should have been stoned. He wasn't denying the word. What he was having a problem with is who held the stones. In other words, he said it, you without what? Cast the first In other words, you're just as guilty in the throne room of God as she is. Drop your stone. You have no right to cast the stone of condemnation. Now, why would he say, neither do I condemn it? Because Jesus knew that he was going to Calvary to take care of that woman's sin. Are y'all listening to me? He continued to push man's sins further down the road, further down the road. All he did was stop the trial of them stoning her by saying every man is guilty before God. Now, if we confess our sin, which we're gonna get to a little later, the point is Christ as an advocate will not represent you in the presence of God if you are not willing to. To confess. Amen. No man but are come to the gospel and ever tell me he's innocent of anything. We are guilty of all. Amen. You say, but I, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. Yep, but if you break the law in one point, you're guilty of what? All, all of the law. So, but if we confess our sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and clean and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now listen to me. Is it just for God to forgive us? Don't answer it. Is it just for God to forgive us? What would justice give us? Does justice give us forgiveness? Now hold on. Because you'll hear Brother Adam say, I don't want his justice. And that would sound like well, then God threw away his justice. No. What Brother Bam is saying is, I don't want what justly should be given to me. But that doesn't mean that somebody didn't take what should be given to me. You see, it would sound like that the gospel is throwing away God's justice in order to save us. No. Somebody had to pay the price so that it would be just for God to give us mercy. It is not just for God to give us mercy if he has to overstep his own law. Right. Amen. Now I'm getting to something. Say, well, he did to Adam. No, 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 no. Study the scriptures. Look at it closely. He didn't just come down and pardon Adam and Eve. Right. Right. No. What did he do before he got there? Slay the lamb. In other words, what he's telling man is in this great plan, something's got to die. Something's got to meet this justice. If I'm a just God, my law cannot be bypassed. 
So what he did, who? He come down and gave a propitiation. Something died so that man and woman could be covered before they ever left the Garden of Eden. Now, I didn't say forgiven, and I didn't say as if, you know, that took, no. But Ben said it only covered it and pushed it further down the road. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, there is no lamb, no sacrifice ever in the Old Testament that ever took out of God's memory what man did in the Garden of Eden. Never, never. It said these same sacrifices made every day by the high priest, said every year by the high priest, could never take away sins. But a remembrance of sins was made every year. So in the mind of the judge, for you to come in this age and, oh my, and continue what they did in the Old Testament, you have not wiped out of God's mind what was still, what man did in the Garden of Eden. Every time a sacrifice is made, it reminded God of what man did. A remembrance of sins was made every year. But if you get the right advocate and the right attorney and walk in his presence, not bypassing his justice, but walk in there and say, I'm guilty. I deserve to be condemned. I deserve to die, I deserve to be executed but I've got an attorney right here i got an advocate right here and if you'll do that, then the Bible says your sins and your iniquities will he remember no more why? because now you've got an advocate and a sacrifice that don't have power to cover you it has power to wipe out of God's mind anything you ever committed come on somebody say praise the Lord now, so what I'm getting at, stay with me, is this ideal that we preach grace, but we don't understand why you have grace. We preach mercy, but we don't really captivate what it took for God to display mercy. Now, this is going to be good because literally God, I know this is strong words, but he's literally got to save you from himself as judge. And the only way he can do that is to come down from judge and become attorney and represent you in his own court. And you'll see by the night, he gave you such an advocate that you can never lose. He gave you such an advocate that even if you go by the way, the grave death can't hold you. Somebody is representing you not only as a man who died, but as a man who raised again. And if God raised him up again, he'll raise you up again. You follow the pattern of your attorney. So he says, everybody with me? It would seem that because we are guilty sinners, that justice could not forgive us and therefore somehow love overpowers justice but he is faithful and just listen to me he is faithful and just he's not faithful and he would be unjust if he saved you without his own law being met you see because it wouldn't be correct then he wouldn't be just because he bypassed his own law something has to die you're quiet Y'all know I'm right, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from A-L-L, all. There ain't a sin on you nowhere. Now, his gracious forgiveness (laughs) then is an act of his holy justice. His gracious forgiveness is an act of his holy justice. Now, is that a contradiction? No. Mercy and justice only seems to contradict one another. But sometimes, listen to me now, the greater revelation lays in the apparent contradiction. We either get mercy or we get justice. If we get mercy, that means we didn't get what we deserved. How can that be justice? If we get justice, then we get what we deserved, and how can that be mercy? 
They seem mutually exclusive because the common understanding of justice is that it requires the guilty to be punished. And they will be. If justice isn't met. And they will be if a pardon is extended, but you won't receive it as a pardon. Because some men's sins will go before and some men's sins will follow. How, which way y'all want y'alls to go? Everybody say before. All right. How can he be merciful and just to the same person at the same time? God is a God of justice and we can't get around that. I want to give you a couple things to think about here for a second. Exodus 34 Verse 6 and 7. Turn there if you would. Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> and the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. And look at all those attributes right there. Listen to it again. The Lord... Comma, the Lord God, comma, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Now watch this. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Amen. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Amen. What? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. Do you see what God did? He didn't trade out his mercy for his justice. No. There's no sacrifice of justice for God in the act of mercy. He is both merciful and just. Go with me to Numbers 14, verse 18. The Lord is long-suffering. Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. Yes. Do you see what he's saying? That God's nature is mercy. He's just. He's righteous. He's forgiven. But this, look what he said. But by no means clearing the guilty. In other words, he's not bypassing what ought to be given to man for his, in his guilty state. What we're thinking, what man presents is that the gospel is God extending mercy and love and forgiving all those things, not realizing he didn't bypass the guilty. Somebody paid the price. Amen. And God is saying, if we don't get it right, then the iniquities of our parents will pass down to the third and the fourth generation. And I can show you where one act committed by, just read it the other day, one act committed by Lot and his daughters kept the generations out of the tabernacle of God for 10 generations, 400 years. No Moabite entered into the congregation of the Lord for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, a little Moabite comes into the picture in God's kingdom. And, but, think about this. This little Moabite who was a descendant of Moab that come out of incest through Lot and his daughter, her name was Ruth. And she was a Gentile. And you notice she only got in when her kinsman redeemer paid the price. And he got 10 men and stood them all out there. You know what those 10 men were? The 10 commandments where the whole world's getting before God. Stands there and takes his shoe off and throws it as a type of taking off his righteousness and becoming our sin. And there in the presence of those 10 men, he pays the price in order to redeem Ruth. Jesus Christ came and died under God's own judgment. Amen. Took his righteousness and threw it off and become our sin in order to redeem a Gentile bride back to himself. Amen. He's our kinsman redeemer. We could never become God, so God became us. Amen. Oh, glory to God. And that great picture, little book of Ruth, Little book in the Old Testament named after a woman who was not even a Hebrew. She was a Gentile. And she got in the kingdom. She got into the economy of God because a Hebrew named Boaz 
She was the nearest. Brother Bantam, which I, I don't have time, but we can go into it. You know the story. The nearest kinsman couldn't afford to pay the price. And Brother Bantam said the closest to one, one to us in our fallen condition was Lucifer, but he couldn't pay the price. Brother, God withheld the very thing that would be needed in order to redeem us. He was co-equal with God, all but what? Creator. And it was creation that he would have to use in order to become one of us. God used creation to make us, hallelujah, and he used creation to redeem us. And he used creation the last days to prove we've been redeemed. You love him? Now listen, he will by no means clear in the guilty. Visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and the fourth generation. Proverbs eleven twenty one. I'll read it quickly. The wicked shall not be unpunished. Nahum 1 and 3, the Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Isaiah 45, 21, there is no God else beside me, a just God. I want you to turn that one. Isaiah 45, 21. There is no God beside me, a just God, and a what? Savior. Look at the bottom of that. There is no God else beside me, a just God, and a what? And there's none beside me. You notice he called himself just and the Savior. He didn't leave out his ju- the fact that he was just. And the only way he's going to be a Savior, he cannot bypass his justice. He said he will not clear the guilty. He will not let the wicked go unpunished. I can read it to you. He made his death with the wicked. Oh, but he only had to pay a little price. No, you're wicked. Well, he he didn't really have to go to the extent he went to save me. Yes, he did. You're wicked. Well, I'm a good boy. You're wicked. Yeah, but I was raised in, you're wicked. I come out of a Christian, you're wicked. It wasn't wasn't like God had to overpay. No, he paid. And everything that was paid at Calvary should have been you. Brother Abraham said when Abraham asked God, whereby shall I know this? God put him to sleep. You remember the sacrifice representing Calvary, darkness come over the land and then a light passed through them pieces of animal and Brother Bam said that fire represented where every one of us should go. Amen. Represented our judgment. Amen. He said, this is Brother Bam, we're all deserving of hell. Amen. Amen. Oh, but I know you ain't good. There's none good but God. Amen. Yeah, but I wasn't fully, yes you were, you were fully a sinner. Yeah, but I didn't smoke. Didn't. Go tell God that on their judgment. I never smoked and drank. Tell God that. See how far it gets you. Just go up there and name a bunch of stuff you did good. I, 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 I believe you're going to find out you ain't going to like his words to you. Depart from me, you worker of. I never, don't come bragging to God about what you've done. You ain't going to like the judge's response. If anything, you better hope he remembers something you've done. Don't go telling God what you did. That crowd telling God what they did, he said, depart from me. That other crowd, God told them what they did. They said, when would, they do, when would we do this? He said, when you've done the least of these, my brother, you've done it to me. I know that ain't bride, but you see what I'm saying. Don't come telling God anything you've done. Amen. I ain't coming in his presence, but telling him one thing, I'm guilty. What are we going to do about it? I don't know what to do about it. But I didn't come into your courtroom empty. I brought an advocate with me. I'm believing in your son. I'm believing in your plan. I'm believing you became me. I'm believing your justice has been met. What's the verdict? He couldn't say you're guilty. I already said I'm guilty. He says you're innocent. You never did sin. Why? I got an advocate. God is just and he is a savior at the same time. But being a savior doesn't mean, Brother Bill, he bypasses his justice. So what do we see? At the same time, this is important. You'll see why in a minute. At the same time, he's just 
and he is a savior. At the same time, he can satisfy justice and mercy at the same time. Amen. At the same time, he's dying and said this is finished. He can also say, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. He can be satisfied God's justice and extended mercy at the same time. God is just. God is righteous. God is holy. Listen to me. God will judge sinners. They are not off the hook. And God will not let sin go unpunished. If you don't want to come by faith into God's courtroom and identify with his provided sacrifice, your sin will not go unpunished. You'll either accept somebody paid it or you're going to pay it. And there's a lot of people, whether you know it or not, would rather stand that day than to humble themselves enough and confess they're guilty. They got enough pride in them that come from the hiss of the devil that they'd rather stand in God's presence on dead judgment and tell God they was a good moral person. And they're not, not, they're not going to like the response of God either. Because for 2,000 years, he's presenting such a great gospel of grace. And they turn it down because their pride keeps them from it. No, God will not let sin go unpunished. For him to do so, listen to this closely. For God to let sin go unpunished would raise this morning, even in my mind, serious questions about his holiness and the integrity of his own nature. If God would bypass his own word in order to save me, I could not have total confidence that he would keep his word when I need him. But because he didn't bypass his own word and because he did pay the price and because he did keep his own law, and I know Jesus died under the judgment of God. Amen. He did not die under the judgment of man. He died under the judgment of God. Amen. And it satisfied God's justice. It gives me more confidence that you let a man die like that because of your own integrity. It tells me after 2,000 years, that same God that would put his son through that, if God would put his son there in order to hold his own law, how much more would he stand behind his word to us who've been saved by grace? Amen. How many believes it? Amen. Listen to me now. It's so defined. Two writers, Matthew and Luke, both say, even what's spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which is spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed on housetops. And he says, for there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be made known. In other words, no sin is getting by. God's justice cries for retribution. And you cannot sing what Brother Nick sang about the book being open and it being cleared. You can't sing that if you don't help what I'm talking about this morning in God's presence. And advocate, you will stand there and your pages will be full of unbelief, full of records of things that you committed against God. Amen. Brother Bam would say it like this. There's a record that starts. Remember that? Starts when you're a child and it starts playing your life and everything you've ever committed is playing on that. And he said it will play at the bar of God in the judgments of God. Yeah. Anyway, one thing, years ago, when I first come to this church, y'all had cassette tapes and you had this thing and this church was pretty futile and I, I wasn't that way. If there was a tape and it was recorded over, I see throw it out, put a new one in. But they'd have this thing that goes and it would pull off what was on that magnetic tape and you could reuse it. But every now and then, that little eraser didn't complete it and when you put the tape in, you could hear the new sermon but you could hear an echo in the background of the old voice. That ain't God. I said, that ain't God. 
Brother, when he erases it and wipes, <laughs> cleans your slate at that judgment, ain't gonna be no background sin. Ain't gonna be no background accusation. It's wiped out forever. There's one voice pleading your case, and that's the voice of that the Christ through the blood, the blood of the Son of God. Amen. And Brother Ben said, it's like bleach. Amen. The bleach, he got the bleach of the blood of the Clorox of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dip a man in there, and his sins are so broke up, he said, you can't even find it no more. And even if the accuser could come on that day and say, play that one over there on the right, play his. If we did play it, there wouldn't be a sound on it. Amen. If we did open his book, there wouldn't be one sin against him. All you'd do is open up and see red blood. If you did play our record, and they did push play on the day of judgment, for us who are with him in the judgment, during the judgment, and you did push play, I believe there'd only be one voice that would play on that day, and that'd be Brother Branham saying, you little bride, you never did it in the first place. <laughs> Deal with that, accuser. Deal with that, prosecutor. Brother, the voice on these tapes silences the voice of our critics. It silences the voice of the prosecutor. He don't know what to say when there's a vindicated voice that says you never did sin. As a matter of fact, I even got quotes to tell you. They eat Brother Joseph up a few years ago. And I may not necessarily, well, I probably agree with him more than what I disagree with him on. And I probably agree with him more than what I can agree with these other guys on. And he says that that force will be playing at the judgment. I agree with him. And I'll tell you something else, I'll go deeper with you. It'll even be playing in that spooky place called hell. He said, my voice will haunt you, even that spooky place. You ain't getting around God's vindicated voice. And I'm not really here to cry out my differences with my brother anyways. Because I believe we believe the same message. Listen, justice, can I have just a few more minutes? Because I want to finish this tonight. Justice cries for retribution. Every sin will be accounted for. Amen. Every sin is on record. And I don't mean God has to keep rewriting and erasing. Mm -mm. Every sin demands judgment. One word disbelieved in the garden caused death to fall on the entire human race. No sin ever committed by anybody, anytime, known or unknown, will go unpunished. Therefore, God's mercy is not some sentimental, you know, mitigating that softens and weakens and replaces God's justice. No. The truth is absolute justice must be satisfied. In fact, it will be satisfied. In fact, it has been satisfied. Amen. And God is not extending such mercy and grace that I'm talking about this morning that could declare you innocent in the presence of God. He could not do that. He could not announce that in this day had the full payment and the atonement been revealed and displayed in its fullness. Man hated it so much. Listen to me. Say, oh, yeah, 2,000 years ago. Man, Christopher, they hated it so much he'd come back down this day to display his love one more time. And the Gentiles turn around in Hebrews 6 and do the same thing that they did 2,000 years ago. And a prophet stands and they open the seals and comes down to Jehovah and indicts this generation again for the second crucifixion of our Lord because you've crucified the effects of the gospel to the people. That's how much they hate it. And today, just this morning, I don't know if he's listening or not, and, and I wrote him back, said, brother, I wouldn't even waste my time on these people. And he's going to send me a video of some man, you know, mocking Brother Bradham on the three. But I don't care what these dudes say. You think I'm interested in some unvindicated individual that's smart and intellectual. You think I care what he says? Then I listen to him talk, and I know right then, I can listen five minutes and tell these, these guys don't even know what they're talking about and don't even understand the nature of God or the nature of Brother Branham. They totally miss it, and they're going to miss it. They have to do what they do. But I said, I wouldn't give them guys the time of day. So, well, they're, they're really messing people up. No, they ain't. 
They're taking people away that needs to go away. They ain't fooling the elect. They ain't messing with God's bride. She knows where she stands. I wouldn't help you line up a hundred of those idiots. I don't care how smart they are. I'm gonna go back to one thing. Ain't one of y'all vindicated. How good it sounds. How smart it sounds. How much you think you're disproving, brother man. You ain't disproving nothing. That same devil that's talking out of you is the same devil that talks out of men that condemns this Bible. So don't waste my time. Listen, let me come to this point. At the same time God's justice is met, mercy will be given to the guilty. Because he said he would not hold the guilty, he would not hold them without punishing them. But at the same time that God's justice is met, because remember, there's justice cries out for retribution. Every sin must be dealt with. At the same time that God's justice was met, sin was dealt with. Jesus cried, it is finished. I'm going to tell you what happened there just in a minute. He cried, it is finished. At that same time, out of that same throne room, where cry, cried out for, for, for retribution must be dealt with, and sin was met, and the just, God's justice was satisfied out of that same throne room that called the throne of judgment now becomes the throne of mercy. Amen. You, this side of Calvary, that throne of mercy comes out with seven voices. From Paul to William Branham. Crying God's mercy to every age. Seven voices. Seven voices. Seven stars. Seven gospel trumpets. Trumpeting God's gospel message. None of them bypass God's justice. They knew justice had been met. And now what would be the throne? You, I'm telling you, come up that throne and don't have the right attorney, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. It will remain a throne of judgment. But you stand there identified with the right advocate and somebody can plead your case. Amen. Out of that throne will come mercy flooding out over your life. The gospel is presented on God's love. Rarely men consider his justice, his holy hatred of sin. You say, how much does God hate sin? He hates it so much that he forsook his own son. Brother Bradham said Jesus died at Calvary as a man and cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God turned his back on him at Calvary. Amen. He forsook him. Why would he forsake him? Because judgment was being poured out upon him. But listen to me. He poured out judgment on him and he forsook him so that his justice could be met. Then turn around and pours out mercy on you so that you could say, he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll be with me always, even to the end of the world. God forsook him so he would never forsake us. He put judgment on us to him so he could put mercy on us. We cannot talk about God's forgiveness and love and not consider God's just demand for judgment of every sin. What does that mean? No sin ever committed by anyone goes unpunished. Do you believe that? If justice is to be satisfied, then it must punish sin. Brother Bam would go as far as to tell you that after he died, they put his body in the grave. This is his statement. He went to hell. You know why he went to hell? So you ain't got to go. And while he was there, he took the key so he'd have power over it. Amen. And he's got a little bride here that trusts in the right advocate this morning, the correct defense attorney, and that key will never unlock the gates of hell to put you in there. Right. Matter of fact, he puts us so much on the rock, he said the gates of hell won't even prevail against this revelation we got this morning. 
What is that revelation? Who he is. I know who he is. God become a man. Did to become veiled in a human form. Become my kinsman redeemer. I found out the judge and the attorney is the exact same person. Now I know by what I'm preaching, God wasn't again me Christ was for me. They was the same person. One was as a judge, the other was an attorney. God became a man. What is the price of sin? Yeah. You want the wages? You work all week, you want your wages? You live this life, you reject Christ, you reject the atonement, you reject the advocate, you don't want the high priest. Guess what your wages are? Death. The wages of sin is, what is sin? Right, just disbelief. You're going to get paid all right. But don't, don't stop there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift. But it's a gift. Look, if I went down today and bought this young man right here a tie, it didn't cost you nothing, would it? Why you smile? You want a tie? I got a lot of ties. I'm the only preacher that pays ties to his congregation. I give away about 50 or 60 ties a year. I wear them for a little while. I look across the audience sometimes and go, that's my tie. It looks pretty good on them. <laughs> and so I go buy you a tie. Well, it don't cost you nothing. And I give it to you because it's a gift. But it costs me something to give it to you. I paid the price to give you the gift. <laughs> God paid the price. Justice was met. And he paid the price in Christ. I didn't pay the price. He paid the price. But he gave me and you the gift. What is the gift? Eternal life. Now we can't never die. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? Believest thou this? Thank you. Amen. So be it. Now, while justice demands punishment, mercy cries out for rescuing the sinner. And the gospel is not that God is not going to judge every sin. That's good news. That's not good news, the fact that God is going to judge every sin. The good news is, is that every sin will be punished, and yet every sinner will be forgiven. That's the good news, is that every sin will be punished, but yet every sinner who believes will be forgiven. God will save sinners and satisfy his mercy and satisfy his justice at the same time. Amen. Oh boy, that makes me happy this morning. Makes me read even the Bible in a different light. I'm gonna stop with this right here. One statement, I'm done. And then tonight we'll go back into the courtroom because I want to Spell out the rest of it. The indictment is, we've all sinned. Anybody ever sin after you get saved? Sure. So I never dis. Wait, wait. My Bible tells me, even if you disbelieve, he abides faithful. He won't deny his own. Cannot deny himself, and you're a part of him. I believe John the Baptist was saved. Come on now. He was God's Bible said he had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. He came out there and introduced Jesus as the Messiah, saw the dove, saw the light, heard the voice, baptized him, and then turned around, and a woman got after him on his message of marriage and divorce, put him in jail, and he sent some of his disciples go ask him, are you the one? Shall we look for another? And Brother Ben said his eagle eye got filmed over. And that's John the Baptist, whom Jesus said they wasn't greater born among women than John the Baptist. Let me just tell you this, and I'm done. This power that saved you is the same power that will keep you. When you become weak, he's still strong. You know, for like you can hold on, he still got a hold of you. When he said you were innocent and you never did it, 
He ain't changing his mind about it. Let me tell you why. His justice has been met. His declaration now is, you never sinned in the first place. Let's bow our heads this morning. Musicians, come please. Brother Nick, if you would come. I got a little song that I was singing this week as I was studying some of this. Paid in full. And it says, when justice called for the payment of sin, no one worthy could be found among men. But the precious Son of God with a cross and thorny crown paid the debt with the blood of the Lamb. Paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. Father, this morning, we thank you for your holy word. And we believe the divine declaration that's been given to us upon the scriptures. And I pray now that the reality, the revelation, the magnificent truth of your justice and grace and mercy will be revealed to every heart. And that, Lord, what it should produce is a greater love in our hearts toward you, realizing the extent that you would go in order to save us, in order to redeem us. I pray now, Father, that will be a reality to every soul. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church says, stand with me if you would. When I think of where I came from and how Jesus brought me out from a life of shame and sorrow lost in sin without a doubt with all my heart I'm gonna praise him for the love he gave to me when the precious hand of Jesus way down and lifted me from the depth of the pit I tried so hard but I couldn't touch him there in my despair I cried so loud it seemed no one could hear me Lost and undone Full of sin And so corrupt God's hand reached farther down Than I could reach up I was like a man Locked up in prison with no one to go my bail Every time I sought for freedom All endeavors only fail There I was in sin's dark dungeon Bound by chains of misery Until the Lord paid Unlock myself and set me free From the depth of the pit I tried so hard, but I couldn't touch him 